five o'clock. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon to um, our fellow Europeans. Good morning to those who joined us from the Americas and a late good evening of, uh, or a very early good morning for those joining us from Asia. This is the International Space Science Institute's uh, Game Changer Seminar Series, where we look at missions that change the game in the space sciences. And I am Tilman Schwan, I'm your host here at ISI, as I've been for the previous seminars. Today we resume uh, uh, the seminar after a break uh, last week for a workshop here at ISI, with a, uh, and we will uh, resume with a talk on Juno and the king of the planets, Jupiter. But before I introduce today's speaker, let me just tell you uh, that we have finalized the program now through October. Uh, so next week we will have Athena uh, Kusinis speak on Cassini Huygens at Titan, and then a week later Jessica Agarwal on Rosetta. We will then change gears in October a bit uh, with uh, some talks on the sun and the magnetic field and plasma in the solar system. But on October the 8th, we will have another planetary exploration talk about the Dawn mission to Vesta and Ceres. Just watch our web page and you will get all the, um, the dates and the, the, and the uh, titles. If you missed one of the previous talks, they are available as recordings on our website and we have quite substantial numbers of downloads. So we're very pleased with that. Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Ravid Heled as the speaker of today's seminar. She's from Israel, but has been for quite some time a professor of theoretical astrophysics at the Zurich University. She's a very renowned expert of gaseous planets in our solar system and beyond exoplanets, and a member of the Juno science team. And I'm very thankful to uh, Ravid to have her here today and explain us just how Juno revolutionized our understanding of Jupiter and the giant plants in general. So Ravid, the floor is yours. Thanks, thanks Tilman, thanks for the invitation and thanks all of you who joined uh, the talk. Um, okay, so as uh, Tilman said, uh, the talk is about Jupiter and how Juno helps to reveal the mysteries of this uh, planet. Uh, and of course, I would like to thank the Juno Science team and my students and collaborators. Whoops. Okay, so a bit of a talk outline. I will give a short overview, then we'll briefly discuss uh, the Juno mission, talk a bit about planet formation, planetary interiors, and we'll end up with conclusions. So the importance of giant planets. Why are giant planets important? Well, for two main reasons. First of all, giant planets shape the architecture of planetary systems. This is because they are very massive, so clearly their gravity influences the planetary system. And the second is the, their fast formation. Since giant planets form relatively early in protoplanetary disks, they can excite small bodies and lead to uh, volatile de delivery. For example, we think that some of the water we have on Earth is because of Jupiter exciting uh, water-rich objects, bringing them to the inner solar system. The second reason is their composition. Their composition provides information on the physical and chemical properties of protoplanetary disks. Again, this is because they form early and because they manage to accrete hydrogen and helium from the disk. And therefore, if we can understand their, from their uh, composition, we can better understand what were the properties of protoplanetary disks. Uh, and that if that was not uh, convincing enough, you can just look at the planets in the solar system and you can just see by size, these are the dominating planets. It is really the outer planets that dominate in terms of the mass. And of course, it is Jupiter and Saturn uh, that are the most massive ones with Jupiter really being the king of the planet. So a few basic facts about Jupiter. Um, for those of you who don't uh, study Jupiter on a daily basis, so the mass is 318, the mass of the Earth. So this is a very massive planet. It is located at 5.2 astronomical units. Its um, size is more than 70,000 kilometers. This is the equatorial radius, 71,000. Uh, the average density is 1.3 gram per cc. The temperature at one bar is 165, so this is cold. But this uh, should not confuse you. In the deep interior, Jupiter is, is rather hot. The composition, we know that 
Jupiter is hygiene and helium dominated, but it also has some heavy elements. And for us, heavy elements is anything that is heavier than helium. So this can be oxygen, carbon, iron, uh, silicon, again, everything heavier than, than helium. It rotates fast, less than, a bit less than 10 hours. So if you think about a fluid gaseous planet that rotates fast, you can already um, predict that it would have strong winds and very rich dynamical features. It also has a very strong magnetic field, the uh, strongest in the, in the solar system from the planet. And it also has the four uh, famous Galilean satellites and many other irregular and captured satellites. And here on the, on the right, you can see a sketch of what we think uh, Jupiter looks like from the inside, but while we'll talk about it uh, today, basically some key questions is, uh, how, how did Jupiter form? Does it have a core? How many heavy elements? So as I said, we know that the composition is hydrogen helium dominated, but it is actually the heavy elements that can reveal some information about its formation process. And this is why we really want to determine this number. Um, the other thing is that Jupiter is really used as a, as a giant planet prototype. When we discover giant planets around other stars, we always have this tendency to compare them to Jupiter. But when we do this comparison, we have to uh, first understand our own giant planet in, in a good way. And as you will see, uh, Juno made us realize that actually we don't understand Jupiter as, as, as well as we thought. Okay, so a little bit about the Juno mission. So this is a NASA mission, the PI is Scott Bolton from Swery. Um, so you can see here the Juno spacecraft in the background of Jupiter. Um, just a little bit about the name. So um, the name Juno is the, the name of the wife of, of Zeus, so Jupiter. And the idea is that he tried to hide some of his um, misbehavior and she could basically look behind, uh, beneath this, the, the clouds and reveal what, what he's doing and basically reveal his true nature. And the idea is similar to the uh, Juno mission. So basically, while we see Jupiter's atmosphere, we don't know what's going on underneath. We cannot probe all the way to the center. And the idea is that the Juno mission helps us to do that. So really to reveal uh, Jupiter's true nature. Um, so here, again, you can see some uh, key facts about the Juno mission. Again, with the key or big aim is to understand the formation and evolution of the solar system because of the reasons I, I, I just uh, explained before. Uh, in terms of Jupiter formation, we want to understand how Jupiter formed, when, where exactly, and how long did it take uh, for, for the planet to form. So Juno is a spinning polar orbiter spacecraft. It was launched in August 2011. It had five-year cruise to Jupiter. It arrived in 2016. It has polar five days orbits. And the end of the mission will be via the orbit into Jupiter, of course, because we don't want to pollute uh, the environment, especially since there might be uh, life on the Galilean satellite. So we don't want to uh, leave any trash. And this is why the end of the mission will be uh, basically crashing into Jupiter. It has eight uh, science instruments to conduct gravity, magnetic and atmospheric investigations, plus a camera for public outreach with the objectives as I said, is to understand giant planet formation and evolution by study different aspects regarding Jupiter. So the origin, the internal structure, the atmospheric composition and its variation, the dynamics and its magnetosphere. So here I list a few key questions, but I have to say there are many more. So for me, how did Jupiter form? A key question. What is Jupiter internal structure and composition? So what it, what it is um, the composition of the planet? Is there a core? And if so, how massive it is? Does it rotate as a solid body? How is the magnetic field generated? How deep are the winds on Jupiter? We see that it has very strong winds, but we don't know how deep they go. Uh, what are the physical processes that power the auras? And how do the poles look like? Now we know, but before you know, we didn't. Here you can see the spacecraft and the payload. Um, so you can see the different instruments. Uh, and for uh, internal structure models, it is really the gravity science experiment that, uh, uh, that is key, but you can see we have MWR for microwaves, we have JD and JED, we have the magnetometer here, um, and here you have um, the Juno cam for public outreach, uh, UV spectrometer, radio and plasma for the waves uh, experiment, and the GRAM, which is uh, infrared. 
Okay, so because uh, in the advertisement, there was a mentioning of the Lego, so I had to put a slide about the, the Lego features. So it is true that Juno uh, had very special uh, passengers, and these are uh, Galileo, Juno, and Jupiter made of aluminum, but looking like Lego, so that was a collaboration with, uh, with Lego. Uh, and that was for outreach and educational uh, purposes, so there was a NASA and Lego um, program, with the aim to inspire children to explore science and be aware of space program. And you can see here in this um, location, uh, they put the Lego fi uh, figure. So again, here you can see Galileo with Jupiter and the telescope. And then we have Juno and Jupiter. So here you can see the spacecraft being prepared before launch. And here you can see that was 4th of August, uh, 2011 in Florida, and this is before uh, the launch. Uh, I was also there, you can see me here, and this is Scott Bolton, the uh, PI of the mission. And here you can see the launch, that was on Atlas V551. Uh, so that was very exciting, I was there. My daughter, she was four years old at the time, She's, and then she was so excited, and then, then she asked me, hey mom, can we come again tomorrow? And I was like, no, unfortunately, these things don't happen very often. Uh, but it was very exciting, really great to see, to see um, a launch. Okay, so here you can see uh, Juno orbit. Uh, so it, uh, it leaves the Earth. So you can see here Juno, here is Earth's orbit, here are the inner planets. Then in uh, 2012, there was a deep space maneuver. You can see Earth is, is here and then Juno is coming back to Earth for a gravity assist. So that was 2013. Yeah, so we had Earth flyby, and then Juno is flying on the way to Jupiter. So this took five years, and the idea is that you don't want the spacecraft to come too fast because you want it to be slow enough so it can be captured in the gravity field of Jupiter. So here you can see Juno is approaching Jupiter. And it really arrived to Jupiter in July 4th, 2016, and it is now orbiting Jupiter as, as we speak. So as I said, Juno has elliptical polar orbits. These are ideal to um, measure the gravity field of the planet. Uh, it can reach very close to, to Jupiter, uh, also cover the entire surface due to the fast rotation of, uh, of the planet and the uh, geometry configuration of the orbits. But going to po from pole to pole takes only two hours. So actually the spacecraft spends most of its time uh, far away from, from Jupiter and the key measurements are done only uh, when it's very close to the, to the planet. As I said, there are different instruments and I'm going to concentrate on the gravity science, but I cannot give this talk without mentioning JunoCam, which is a public science and outreach camera. So again, this was not done for scientific purposes, uh, but I think it became very famous because it really gave the best resolution ever images acquired uh, of Jupiter's cloud tops and, and polar regions. And I'm sure you've seen that in the newspaper and, and everywhere. And many people I know, they have these images as, as you know, on their desktop because they are really amazing. So here we can see Jupiter in real color. It has more this uh, pastel color. Uh, and here you can see Jupiter's South Pole. So uh, on the left, you see it in real color. So that was the first time that we could actually see the poles of Jupiter. So very interesting, you know, with many, many features. And here you can see, again, I think a very famous uh, image. This is with enhanced color, but it helps you to see all these dynamical features that are super interesting. And this image is uh, composed of, of uh, a few images. So this was, uh, so this is for uh, uh, Juno Cam, which, which is really cool. Okay, but I said that I'm going to concentrate on, on the gravity um, science, and this is because uh, this experiment gives us the information about the gravity field of Jupiter. And basically the idea is that because um, we can trace the spacecraft very accurately, then we can basically use this information to understand how the mass is distributed within the planet. And this is done basically uh, with, with Doppler uh, tracking. And you can see here, uh, you know, the Doppler shifts of the signal and you can see in this uh, animation. So basically the computed orbit, and then you can see that uh, the, the real orbit is actually 
uh, perturbed due to, due to uh, the interior of Jupiter and, and its mass distribution. So when we have that, when we have this super accurate signal, we can convert this information uh, of the gravity field and learn the internal structure uh, of Jupiter. So here you can see, so here we have the antenna. So that's again the gravity sign. So it was X band and K N band. And basically the signal is, is sent back to Earth. Okay. So as I said, Juno is, is really, it has all these different instruments and, and there are many results uh, that are already published and are on the process of being published with these different four global themes, the origin of Jupiter, which is to determine the water abundance in, in, the up, in, in Jupiter's atmosphere, constrain its core mass, the composition, the interior to understand the internal structure, the dynamical properties, and by, ma by mapping the gravitational and magnetic fields, then we have um, science focused uh, regarding the atmosphere, so map the variation in the atmospheric composition, temperatures to understand the cloud, cloud opacity, and all the dynamics actually to depths of something like uh, 100 bars or, or even uh, deeper. This is in comparison to the Galileo probe that, that, that reached 22 bars. So that's going much deeper. And then we have the polar magnetosphere to explore the 3D structure of, of uh, the polar magnetosphere and the aurora of Jupiter. So honestly, these are all very rich topics and each topic would, would take uh, many lectures. So I'm going to briefly focus on these two. So origin and the, and the interior of, of, uh, of Jupiter. So as you can see here, one of the aims or one of the objectives is to constrain Jupiter's uh, core mass. So why, why is that? And here I show you a plot that was slightly modified by, by Fortney and uh, Nettleman, where you can see the core mass estimate as a function of year. So year of study, yeah? This is not a super scientific plot, but I think it's very important. And you can see that the first estimate came sometimes in the mid seventies. So that was actually quite high. The core mass estimate was 40 Earth masses. I remind you that the total mass of Jupiter is 318. So it's not huge in comparison to the total mass of the planet, but it's, you know, it's, it's there, it's significant enough. Then you can see that the, uh, the, the uh, mass estimates uh, went down. So here in the eighties, it was more around 10. Um, then, there were solutions with more than 10 or about 10 and lower, about five. Then around the 2000s, it was between zero and, and 15. Okay, and then it's jumping and actually it should be extended even further. So you can see, um, okay, what should you see from this plot? First of all, is that people are trying to constrain the commerce of Jupiter since decades. Okay, so clearly this is, um, you know, a, a real goal of, of planetary scientists. And then you can see that while it, it decreased, we are not really converging. So I think here people already thought, ah, okay, it's converging into a low value, but you can see that later on uh, the values increased again. So, so these are the, the, the two key conclusions from, from this plot. And then you can ask yourself, why? Why do they care so much? Because again, in, term, in terms of percentage, this is not a high, high percentage in comparison to the, to the total mass. But the reason that that people are very interested in determining the core mass of Jupiter, it's because it is because it is linked to giant planet formation. So there are two models for giant planet formation. So you can see it here. So the first one is the standard model. It's called core accretion. And in this model, basically giant planets form in a similar way to terrestrial planets. So they start their formation by building up a, a core uh, via coagulation of uh, planetesimals and then planetary embryos. And once you have a core, a solid, let's say, um, embryo that is um, massive enough, basically uh, this protoplanet can accrete gas from the disk and if the growth is fast enough and efficient enough, then the gas can be accreted on, on top of this core and then a, a giant planet is formed. An alternative model is known as disk instability. And in this formation, you don't need to have a core in order to form the planet. But the idea is that in early times, the protoplanetary disk is massive enough 
And then you can have a local gravitational instability in the disk. So you have a local collapse, just like you form stars. And then this particular uh, region can collapse and evolve to become a gas giant planet. So this is the, uh, the alternative model. And in this model, you don't need to have a core in order to, uh, to form a gas giant planet. It doesn't mean that you don't have a core in the end because actually you could have a core due to <clears throat> grain settling and accretion of solids later on, but this is not a, a requirement. While in the other model, the core accretion model, you have to build up your giant planet by first coagulating uh, heavies and, and have a core. And, and, and because of this, um, two different models that are now, I, I presented them in a very simplified way, but nevertheless, this was the motivations that if we can constrain uh, the core mass of, uh, of Jupiter well enough, we can uh, discriminate uh, among these uh, different models. And of course, as I said, this is also important because it will tell us what is the preferred mechanism, not just for the formation of Jupiter and Saturn, let's say, but also for the formation of uh, giant planets around other stars. So this is really the motivation. Um, I'm going to concentrate uh, on the core equation model here. So here is a sketch that shows what, what is happening in this model. And the nice thing about this model that is that although there are still open questions, it gives it's kind of a consistent explanation for, for the different planets we see in the solar system and actually around other stars. And the idea is the following. At early times, what you have is basically you have a buildup, as I said, of, of a core. So basically you don't have hygiene helium. It is really the heavy elements that dominate. And in this phase, which is called, which we call phase one, is basically uh, when you uh, form a heavy element core via planetesimal or pebble accretion. And if you stop there, then basically you form terrestrial planets. Then you have a second phase, which you can see here, where you uh, don't grow the mass of the core substantially, but you can start to accrete hydrogen helium from the gaseous disk. And if you kind of stop in this phase, then you would have something that has heavy elements, but also a little bit of hydrogen and helium. So if you stop there, you can form an object that looks like, let's say, Uranus and Neptune, or even mini Neptunes, depending on, on the exact parameters. Um, and in order to form a gas giant planet, you need uh, this phase to, to last long enough and accrete enough hydrogen and helium. So here you can see the hydrogen helium mass. So if you, uh, if you as I said, grow, uh, fast enough and you can accrete this gas, then um, basically the hydrogen helium mass can exceed the mass of the heavies and then we reach what we call phase three or runaway gas accretion that basically um, a, a giant planet is formed. So in this stage, a gas accretion rate exceeds the solid accretion rate and we have runaway growth and we form a gas giant planet. So again, here you can see, of course, for Jupiter, uh, we go through all these phases, but it's just to show that this, this formation model can explain the diversity of, of planets. And of course, where, when the, the planet is formed, it depends on, on the local conditions uh, in, the, in a given disk and in, in, in different disks. But that's, that's basically the idea. So for those of you who don't see that every day also, just I, I will uh, repeat it a bit more slowly. So here we can see the mass as a function of time. On purpose, I didn't put numbers because it really depends on the model. It's more for the concept. So here you have, um, you, you have a core, so you form really this, this let's say, solid, uh, heavy element uh, object. Then, um, actually, we find that many of the, heavy, of the heavies can, can be in an envelope, or in, in standard models, it was, it was here, and then um, the heavy elements are not growing, I mean, they, they don't increase substantially during the phase two. And then you have here the hygiene helium mass, when the total planetary mass is this plus that. Okay, so in the standard models, there is no difference between the red line and, and the purple line. Um, but here I indicate two because we find that actually the pure heavy element core is always very small. And actually there are many heavy elements in the envelope and then the planet looks more like that. And this is important because this is what we think that Juno data tell us. Okay. So, Jupiter's formation model. So as I said, in the historical assumption was that uh, there was no difference between these, these two lines. So basically it was just, there was just line for the, uh, for the heavy elements. All the heavy elements were assumed to be in a core. 
So here you wouldn't see brown at all. There would be like a core plus envelope structure. But in fact, once the core reaches a relatively small mass of let's say about two Earth masses, most of the accreted heavy elements actually remain in the envelope. It can be that the envelope is very metal rich. So it can be that, you know, it's 80% of the envelope is heavies, but they will not be in a solid phase. So this is why also thinking about cores of giant planets as solid is, is, is not correct. And when you have this growth, when you accrete hydrogen, helium, and accrete planetesimals or pebbles, but they actually remain in the envelope, what happens is that you can build up composition gradients in the deep interior. So this is before you reach runaway gas accretion. Um, and then the core of your giant planet is no longer this you know, distinct core, but is the innermost region where the heavy element mass fraction is, is sufficiently high. And this is an example of simulations we've, we've done. Here you can see the heavy element mass fraction as a function of normalized mass. And you can see that the there is, there is a gradient. So, so the heavy elements here, it's, it's uh, in the deep interior, it's, it's basically uh, near one, so pure heavy elements, but then there is a, there is a uh, gradual decay in, in the heavy elements. So that suggests that this core envelope structure is, is oversimplified. And then we showed that in, in another paper uh, with Dave Stevenson, well, basically, we, we try to see how this formation of this composition gradient depends on the local conditions in, in the disk. And we found that if you change the solid surface density slightly, but keep everything else the same, you get a different uh, profile. And you can see it here in this, um, in this plot. Here I have the um, heavy element mass fraction uh, as a function of, of, of mass uh, versus time. And the only difference between these two lines is the, uh, heavy, the, the, the amount of heavy elements available to be accreted. And you can see uh, that, the, slow, that, that the, the profile looks different. And here, you, 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 this is the beginning of phase three. This is when we accrete mostly hydrogen and helium. But you can see that the deep interior would have a different um, composition gradient depending on, on this number. Um, sigma, so the solid surface density. But in either, in either way, we find that the cores of giant planets are likely to be fuzzy. So you can see there is this gradual change in the heavy element mass fraction. So there is no you know, density discontinuity or a clear composition discontinuity in the deep interior of giant planets. And we find that actually this, uh, the nature of this gradient really depends on the ratio between the heavy element equation and the, and the gas equation rates. But the conclusion from, from this slide is that really cores of giant planets are likely to be fuzzy. So the core is not distinct from the envelope. It also means that the core uh, includes hydrogen and helium, so it's not a pure heavy element core. Um, and that the deep interior can have a gradual heavy element structure. This is also important because if you have a composition gradient, it also implies that uh, this region might not be fully convective, which is also something that now we learn that Jupiter uh, might not be fully convective. Okay, here I, I just uh, put exoplanet diversity because although I'm going to talk about Jupiter in this talk, the fact that by slightly changing the solid surface density, we get a different slope, it kind of naturally explains why we have around other stars, planets with, uh, you know, similar masses, but very different compositions and therefore different radii. It's just because they would, they, they, are, they probably formed in slightly different locations around this with, with uh, different uh, properties. And, and that, as I said, can really explain the diversity of these objects. So that's, that's the, the, good, the good news about, about this. Okay, so we said that we can form a, a giant planet with composition gradients, but we have to keep in mind that when we look at Jupiter today, uh, it's not necessarily the same as it was just after its formation. And therefore, we have to ask ourselves what happens to, to the planet during the long-term evolution. Um, and in this study, we basically assumed um, a primordial heavy element uh, composition gradient that, that is shown in the, in, the, in the blue. And then we looked what happens as the planet evolves. And you can see that the outer part of the gradient actually becomes fully mixed. So at early times, convection is, uh, is substantial, is efficient, and it can erode the outer part of the gradient. 
and then the material that you have here mixes with the outer uh, uh, with the outer region, so you can actually enrich your atmosphere with heavy elements, even though it was lower below before, you can see. But the inner part of the planet remains unmixed. So that means that actually the heavy element gradient in the deep interior can uh, persist uh, while we get some mixing in the outer part. Of course, this depends on the convection model you're using and the uh, primordial internal structure that is assumed, but it shows to us that this composition gradients can actually um, remain even, even today. Okay, so then we have this idea of the formation and evolution of the planet, and now we have to link it to the structure model of Jupiter today. So planetary interiors, so how do we model the internal structure of Jupiter, or giant planet in general? So how do we do it? Uh, it's not easy. It's not like Earth, which is also not easy. We don't have, um, uh, we don't have seism uh, seismology. Uh, so we have to uh, rely on indirect measurements. And the way it is done uh, is the following. Basically, we have to use the equation of states of assumed compositions. Then we solve the structure equation, the hydrostatic equations, and then we get a model with a density profile um, that has gravitational moments. And we can compare these theoretical gravitational moments to the ones that are measured by spacecraft like Juno. Of course, we also use the mass and the radius uh, of the planet and the one bar temperature uh, to determine the entropy, if, if you wish. Uh, so these are the measurements. So these are the key fundamental uh, properties of the planet and the other um, key measurement is the gravitational moment. And then you try to fit them, and when you get a fit that you can reproduce the gravity field that was measured, you can basically um, give estimates for the mass and distribution of the elements in, inside your planet. So you do it in kind of an um, iterative uh, process, but of course I have to remind you that this is of course non-unique, because I can have more than one model that will uh, fit the, the gravity field, but will have a different uh, composition and a different internal structure. So how it is done in, in practice, this is uh, just to show you um, a little bit the, the physics behind. So basically, uh, this is the total potential of the planet. So it's the uh, gravitational potential plus the um, centrifugal potential. And then we can connect the gravitational harmonics with the density profile. So as we measure the J's uh, more accurately, we can further constrain the density profile. Uh, and here you can see an example. So here uh, you have the contribution function. This is normalized uh, uh, radius. And you can see that um, the different moments give you um, information on slightly different, uh, different regions within the planet. So that also means that as you go to higher, uh, orders of gravity harmonics, actually you get more information about the outer regions of the planet. But if you have that, it's indirectly constrained what is happening uh, in the deep interior. And you can see that actually in the deep interior, uh, the contribution functions are very, very small. They are, they are near zero. So it's very hard to understand what is happening in the deep interior of, of, uh, of Jupiter. But as I said, again, we can put some constraints on the density profile. Uh, but not the composition. Then the composition is inferred based on our model. So again, as I said, the equation of states that we are using and the assumption of the composition. Uh, and then the presence of the core is also inferred indirectly from the model. And the core properties, its composition and physical state cannot be accurately uh, determined. So that's also uh, an important um, fact to keep in mind. Okay, so modeling Jupiter's interior is really not easy. And as you could see, this is something that is, is been, has been done since decades and we still don't have a complete, uh, a complete answer. But the cool thing about it is that uh, whenever we, have, we make efforts to, to study the deep interior, we come up with many new um, ideas and new science and new discoveries. So it's, it's, it's still very great. Um, okay, so... As I said, Juno provides the gravity data. Uh, it gives 
information about the gravitational harmonics of Jupiter, and then we can further constrain the structure model. And as we have more accurate measurements, we have less freedom in the model. So if the J's are poorly measured, well, the, we can find many solutions that can fit the data. But as the data become uh, better and better, or suddenly uh, it's harder to find solutions. Modeling the internal structure of Jupiter is not easy because uh, in the deep interior, because it's so massive, it has very high pressures and temperatures that we don't have on Earth. We can barely uh, probe them with experiments. Uh, and the equation of state is very difficult to calculate. And this is really the challenge in um, uh, making structure models of, uh, of, uh, of Jupiter. Uh, in terms of hydrogen, in the deep interior, basically hydrogen becomes metallic, um, where the transition between molecular hydrogen to metallic uh, hydrogen is estimated to be around one megabar, but that also uh, not in uh, full agreement and depends a little bit also um, on the other elements that you have there. Um, there is also a challenge because of the mixture of hydrogen and helium, because there is the process of helium rain that I will show you in a second. And of course, there are also the heavy elements that can also interact with, with the hydrogen and helium. So really in terms of uh, high pressure physics, this is uh, quite a complex system. Um, so this is hard enough. And nevertheless, we need to make different uh, simplifications, like our models are typically one uh, dimensional or, or, or 2D. We typically assume solid body rotation with some, with, with some corrections for the, uh, for the dynamics. And typically when we do structure models, we don't directly account for the magnetic field. But of course, this is also an important feature of the planet. So here I show you the, um, the phase diagram of, of hydrogen because I really think it's important to understand it's linked to, to Jupiter's uh, interior. So what we can see here is the temperature in Kelvin in, in log scale. And here we have the, the pressure in megabar also in log scale. Here, the different symbols correspond to different experiments. But what you want uh, to see here is the look at the curves of Jupiter and, and Saturn here. There are two curves for, for Jupiter. Uh, these are two different models, but what can we learn? First of all, we can learn that giant planets are fluid. And this is because here we have the solid hydrogen and you can see that the solutions for, uh, for Jupiter and Saturn, they never reach these regions. So, so these are really fluid planets. Um, I would call them fluid planets, not um, you know, gas planets. But okay, that's one thing. And then the other thing you can see that here we have a transition from the atomic fluid or then let's say metallic hydrogen uh, and molecular hydrogen. And you can see that both planets cross this, this curve. Uh, and that tells us that both planets uh, have metallic hydrogen. And this is actually not surprising given the fact that they have such strong magnetic fields because we need the uh, material that is uh, electrically uh, conducting and metallic hydrogen uh, is of course a very good conductor. Okay, so that's the other thing we can, uh, we can learn just by looking at this phase diagram. But as I said, there is another complexity um, when we model the internal structure of Jupiter. So it's not just to understand exactly where this transition happens and what is exactly the curve that uh, represents Jupiter, but also that uh, we expect to have helium demixing uh, in, this, in this region. And that was actually predicted by Dave Stevenson in the early 80s, but was found to be uh, correct by different uh, DFT calculations. Uh, so basically, once you reach a, a, a region in, in, in the phase diagram, you could have some separation uh, of the helium. And then you would basically um, have inhomogeneities in terms of the helium uh, within your planet. Okay, so that means that in the inner part of the planet, I will have a different helium abundance in comparison to the uh, molecular region. Okay, so this information from the phase diagram is the reason that traditional models of Jupiter used to have these three layers. So the innermost layer was the core, was a heavy element core made of rock or ices or both. Then we had the metallic hydrogen uh, region, 
that was also uh, helium rich and the molecular hydrogen region that was helium poor. And the exact numbers uh, I indicate here, they slightly depend on the model, but this was the motivation for having these three layers. Okay, so it was because of the transition from uh, molecular hydrogen to metallic hydrogen and, and, and the existence of helium, um, helium rain or helium separation. But what happens to the heavy elements here? So here there were two approaches. So some, one type of model said that within these two envelopes, the heavy elements are homogeneously uh, distributed. And some said or assumed that this is not the case. And here you have uh, in the metallic hydrogen region, you have a given um, metallicity, while in the outer part of the planet, you have a different metallicity. So this is already quite complex. And nevertheless, this, will, this is a very simplified way to think about, about the planet. And the division is, as I said, is uh, basically backed up due to the, our understanding of, of the hydrogen uh, diagram. And here you can already see the strong connection we have with this other community, because the only way we can improve our models is also by having uh, improved information on the equation of states of hydrogen, helium, and, 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 the, and the other elements and their interplay. Okay, so that was before Juno. The, the data were good, but not great. So people made different models with different model assumptions. And here you can see the gravity, the gravity data before Juno. So here you can uh, just see, for example, we have J6 versus J4, and you can see here different, uh, different solutions. So this is from, from the mid eighties. And then here we had, um, two different solutions. And then what we have is structure models that try to uh, satisfy the gravity data. So you can see here, there were uh, models that some of them could satisfy uh, the JUP230 uh, uh, solution, uh, also models by, by Nettleman et al in 2012. Uh, here there was a point by Hubbard and Militzer. Um, but again, given the fact that the gravity data are not very accurately determined, it's, it's, it's okay because you have solutions that, that fit the data and are consistent with the data. And then we had Juno and that was, that was Juno's point. And you can see that actually there is no model that, that, fits, that fits Juno data. And this is where, in my opinion, there was a really big surprise. And, and this is how really I think missions um, change our understanding of, of planets. Then you can uh, say that, in fact, uh, the uncertainty on this measurement is, is somewhat uh, larger because you don't know the depth of the winds. But that was in uh, 2017. And now, uh, based on measurements of the other monics, we actually constrain the depth of the winds. I don't have time to talk about it in this talk. So actually, the uncertainty is going down again. So, so it's, it's really, the data are really great. And just for those of you who work on similar topics, I just show it here. So here you can see the, the, um, the gravitational moments after the first two Juno orbits. So that was published uh, by uh, Faulkner et al, 2017. And you can see these tiny arrow bars on the J's. And then one year later, the data were published uh, for uh, the first six orbits. And you can see how small the uncertainty is. So this is really, whoa. I mean, suddenly you have such a small uncertainty that you actually don't find a solution for Jupiter that can satisfy the data. And this is, again, because the, these accurate gravity measurements can really constrain the internal structure of the planet. Okay, so we had this data and now we have to make Jupiter models. So in 2017, there was a paper by, by Valetal uh, where different uh, structure models for, for Jupiter were uh, presented. Uh, and the main uh, conclusions you should take from here is that here, uh, the heavy elements were not homogeneously uh, mixed, were not assumed to, to be homogeneously mixed because we couldn't find solutions with that. So this is the a uh, heavy element mass fraction in the outer part of the planet, so in the mo uh, molecular hydrogen region, and this is in the metallic hydrogen region. And you can see that they are never the same. So the, the heavy element mass fraction in the, in the deep interior is always higher 
than in the outer part. So it's definitely not homogeneously mixed in terms of the heavy elements. So Jupiter has an inhomogeneous interior, and of course the question is why, why it is like that. And for me, it provides an amazing link between uh, planetary structure and the origin and evolution of the planet. And a bit later, uh, there was another um, model of, of Jupiter um, by Debras and Chabrier in 2019 that also they find that Jupiter should have a dilute core. And this was also in these models. You see, we had for, uh, for Jupiter in this paper, we had uh, solutions with a dilute core. So what is this dilute core? It's basically you have this innermost region that is not pure heavy elements, but is quite extended but uh, again, it's different from the traditional core plus envelope model. You have some kind of a gradual change in the heavy elements. Um, and as I said, this is a new link between a uh, planetary structure and origin, but definitely it provides a new view of Jupiter. Jupiter is non-homogeneous. It's not fully convective because in this region where you have these composition gradients, as I said, the convection cannot operate. You might have layered convection or conduction, but it's not fully mixed. It's not fully convective. And probably it has this fuzzy core. And as I said, this fuzzy core idea is really what we get from formation models. So I really have this impression that we are slowly converging into, into uh, uh, you know, a place where we can understand uh, giant planets in a better way. But I have to be fair and say that this is, of course, still work in progress and there are many details uh, to figure out. Um, so as I said, this dilute core that can go up to 70% of the planetary radius can actually be explained by these this formation models. And we had different uh, studies in this, in this direction recently. However, although you do form composition gradients uh, due to the formation of the planet, we find that when we uh, use reasonable conditions for the formation of the planet, uh, the dilute core is typically about 20% um, of the mass of, uh, of Jupiter and not, uh, and not more. While for these models, oops, uh, it's around 70%. Uh, you see here, it's 70% of the radius. So we can form dilute cores from formation point of view, but typically they are not extended as predicted by structure models. So here are the solutions from Valetal and, and, and the uh, Debras and Chabrier. And you can see that we find that after some time, things become, the, the gradient is, is being eroded. And then basically uh, the, the composition gradient is, is in the deeper interior. So although we can form fuzzy cores by the core accretion model, uh, it, is, um, it is not easy to fit exactly uh, the conditions that we find in structure models. So forming a fuzzy core in Jupiter is challenging in the standard picture of giant planet formation. So we think there is something there, but it's not the final answer. So what, what could be a solution? Well, maybe a giant impact. So in this paper, uh, we came up with the idea that maybe Jupiter's dilute core is a result of a giant impact. Uh, and the idea is that maybe uh, before the impact, the core was relatively compact, as we find from our simulations. And then if you had a head-on collision of a massive enough embryo, basically it could hit the innermost part of the planet and then form this dilute, more extended core. And I will show it to you here in this movie. So you see you had the compact core for Jupiter, then there is a head-on impact, and then you form a, an extended dilute core. Uh, it's a little bit funny because it's another case where we require a giant impact in the solar system to explain things we don't, we don't understand. And of course it requires special, special conditions, but it doesn't mean it didn't happen. It's, it's, a, valid, it's a valid solution. Um, of course, what I uh, mentioned here was really focused on the gravity field, but there, were many, there are many other uh, key results uh, by Juno, and there are many more to come. Just to mention a few, as I said, we constrained the depth of uh, Jupiter's wind. Um, so that was presented in, in the paper by Caspi et al. Uh, there are also um, new measurements 
uh, regarding Jupiter's magnetic field. It has a much more complex dynamo than we thought initially. And this is also actually linked to the fact that it might have this dilute core that could lead to a more complex dynamo. Uh, there are estimates for the water abundance in Jupiter's atmosphere, which is uh, about two times solar, which is uh, different from the Galileo probe measurement. Uh, and as I said, many more to come and please have a look at these particular papers uh, if you are interested. So here is my last uh, slide. So the conclusions and future, Jupiter is a complex planet. It's inhomogeneous in composition. It's not fully convective and it is expected to have a fuzzy core. So it's really not a ball of gas, simple thing like we thought maybe um, 10 years ago or before Juno. Uh, Jupiter's internal structure and composition are linked to its formation and evolution history. There is a clear interplay between the interior, the magnetic field, and the atmosphere. And I think in the future, this is exactly what we should explore further. Juno data provides many surprises regarding Jupiter. And I really think we are going to be busy in the next few decades, honestly, understanding all these measurements. What's next? A better understanding of the hydrogen helium equation of states. We need to understand what are theoretical uncertainties and what are observational uncertainties because we are reaching a state where the observations are much better and much more accurate than our, than our models. Of course, we need to combine the formation and evolution uh, of the planet with its current structure. Uh, and as I said, we have to keep in mind that Jupiter is the solar system giant planet, uh, but we need to reflect our understanding of, of Jupiter on exogiant planets and vice versa. And I will finish with this uh, movie of, uh, of Jupiter uh, from, um, from the Juno camp. So you can see how beautiful uh, Jupiter is. And I really think that Juno uh, made us look at Jupiter in a different way. It is a much more complex um, planet and there are many, many secrets that we still need to uh, reveal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ravi. This was a very exciting talk. Thank you very much for introducing uh, us to Jupiter and Juno. Now, uh, Ravi is available for uh, uh, questions. Uh, and we have basically two ways of, um, of handling that. You can raise your hand and then you speak yourself and Saliba will give you uh, the floor or you write uh, in, the, in the question in, in the chat channel and then uh, I will read the question uh, to Ravid. I mean, should you have not a microphone available or anything like that? So, um, Saliba, I don't see any raised hands, so why don't I just read the first question to you, Ravid? It's from Hans Sineker, and he wants to know why you called it a fluid planet rather than a gaseous planet. Uh, could you repeat the argument? Is there a gas or liquid phase transition? And he congratulates on, on, on the talk. Yeah, so, um, so the answer is, is, is yes, it is because when we look at the phase diagram, we could see that actually a, a large fraction of, uh, of Jupiter, Jupiter in particular, is in this uh, metallic hydrogen region where actually it is fluid. And when we say, you know, gas, we think about hydrogen in a very fluffy condition, right? Fluffy condition when, when it is gaseous. But in fact, most of the interior of Jupiter is, is fluid. So for me, it's just a little bit misleading because what we see in the atmosphere, it's really the gas, but in the deep interior, it's, it's more fluid. Okay, um, then there is uh, Neil Turner. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, and uh, he wants to know more about the impactor's mass. Can you say something about the impactor's mass? Yeah. Yeah. So in the simulation I have I've showed, um, it was 10 Earth masses. So it's head on. So really like, like that, uh, 10 Earth mass, which is quite, quite massive. If it's uh, not massive, uh, not as massive, like two Earth masses, it will just not penetrate all the way to the center. So it will not make this fuzzy core. Um, according to our simulations, we do it right after the formation of, of Jupiter, so early on. Um, but after already it reached its final masses, it could have happened earlier, it could have happened later. But again, if you think about statistics and end bodies and collisions, uh, the solar system was much more violent in its early phase. So that's why probably if there was such a collision, I would assume that it happened relatively early. 
Okay, the next uh, is by Jack Lissauer, but that's basically an answer to Hans's question. So hi, Jack, but I think we go, uh, go further. Uh, there's a thank you for the excellent talk. And then the question, uh, Hans Sinegger again, can you say more about Jupiter's magnetic field? No, that's a very big question. I, <laughs> I don't think I can answer that. <laughs> Yeah, I can just say that we, we thought that the Jupiter magnetic field is, is much more of a dipole-like. And even the last image I showed of the new uh, Juno results, you could see that there is a spot there, like a blue spot. So you could see that it's not, uh, not very dipole-like. And this could be linked to the fact that maybe you have some kind of a uh, gradient in the electrical conductivity that could explain this a bit more complex uh, dynamo. You can look at some papers by um, Kimi Moore. There are uh, two pa papers from, from the last two years. So there, there is more information there. But I cannot, I cannot get into that, but there are many cool things regarding the magnetic field. Yeah. Lindsay Fletcher wants to know if there's any prospects for seismology on Jupiter. So, well, I mean, we have gases planets seismology, but okay. <laughs> Yeah, so there the, the are ideas in this direction and, and there are efforts. Uh, of course, it's, a no, it's not an easy measurement, but people are thinking along these lines. And actually, uh, there, are, there are groups in, in France that are really pushing that further. Of course, even if you had seismology, which would be great, I have to say, I, I totally support it. But then you would know that you have some breakup of the, of the, um, of the waves, but you would still wouldn't know for sure whether you reach the core and so on. So this interplay is also a bit complex, but definitely we need that. We see from stars that seismology is key and really helps to reveal, to reveal information about the deep interior. Yeah, why don't we take the, well, there, there is uh, Neil Turn again, but maybe we take one of the others first. I mean, uh, Andrew Coates is, uh, is it still thought to be motions of metallic hydrogen driving the magnetic field? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I wouldn't phrase it like that, but yes, it's basically you have this metallic hydrogen, you have convection, you have rotation, then you, you generate a dynamo, and this is how the magnetic field is generated. So, so yes. Yeah, Ronald Redmer wants to know, what do we know about solubility of heavy elements in hydrogen, helium, with respect to core rotor? Yeah, um, so I think Ronald knows these things better than me. I would say that we don't know enough and definitely we should investigate this topic further because that could constrain some of the things in, in our models. Uh, Saliba, do we have any raised hands? Uh, no, mean, not at uh, the moment. Okay, so then I go ahead with Emmerich Spiga. Uh, many thanks for the great talk. Uh, do we expect Saturn's interior to be quite similar to the Jupiter dilute structure found with Juno? Um, yes and no. I think yes. Also now in terms of uh, not being fully convective, we have information from ring seismology that there is a stable region. Um, so it could also have this composition gradients, of course, in the deep interior. But studying the deep interior of Saturn is more complex due to other uh, reasons. But I think they have some similarities and nevertheless, they are not identical. I take the question, the second question of Neil Turner's. Uh, could you comment on how giant planets' elemental accretion history and thus internal structure might be affected by processes such as solid particles drift towards gas pressure peaks in protostellar disks? Um, yes, uh, um, could I comment on that? Well, I think this is a key question. It's a key topic. And of course, we are looking at that in terms of, um, you know, giant planet formation and also giant exoplanets to try to understand if you have different formations and where uh, uh, locations and migration, uh, how, how this affects the enrichments and, and, you know, the expected heavy element enrichment during different uh, phases of the formation. Um, of course, it's not super easy to link because we don't know whether the material was accreted from far or the planet migrated. But I think this, this link is very important and really to, to link this, the composition with the origin, we need to, we need to look at this, these particular questions. There's a follow-up question actually to the seismology uh, question. Uh, Thomas Rader says, um, hasn't Shoemaker-Levy impact been used to investigate the free oscillations? And I think that's true. 
Yeah, so I think there were some, some studies by Mark Marley and, and other collaborators as well as other people. Um, so yeah, that would be, it, it, is, it is a beginning, but Schumacher-Levy was, was not enough. I think you would need, really need something much more substantial um, to infer um, seismology. But of course, if there is going to be an impact uh, in the future and we are lucky enough to detect it like uh, Schumacher-Levy 9, yes, it could be used to, to have uh, to constrain it further. Unfortunately, Jupiter does not have the, the rings like Saturn that, that seismology can be inferred from, from the rings. Ruth Taubner, um, she, like so many others, you know, congratulates you for the great talk. Uh, and the question is, if you had to choose, which uh, giant planet would you uh, send the next mission to? Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> They Uranus and they like you at ESA. <laughs> yeah. So honestly, Uranus, Neptune, we need. I think, yeah, for me, Uranus is the next, but I wouldn't say no to, to, to Neptune. I think we need both. And I think based on what we learn now from Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus, Neptune are both unique. And I think we need missions to both ice giants and we need a substantial mission like an orbiter plus probe for each. I would start with Uranus, but again, I think it should be a substantial mission to each planet separately. Could you suggest any book of how to calculate these type of data for the amateurs? Type of book for That's a difficult question, maybe. Um, no, I don't have in the top of my head. Uh, there are the books by um, uh, Imke de Pater and, and Jack Lissauer, of course, that give some good introduction on the field. Uh, there are some review papers on structure models, so I, I would I would start with those. I have also a few on, on those I can I can send later, but it's it's a bit of a heavy topic. It's not it's not very popular, honestly, also among students. Yeah, Luis wants to know about the helium rain zone. Could you give a brief description of the rain cycle? Does helium somehow evaporates again deeper after raining? Yeah. So so. I have to say I'm not an expert and it's not exactly clear what is happening, but the idea is that once you cross this, this, um, you know, this region on the face diagram, basically you have the separation and then you have the helium settle being settling down. We think it's a very fast process. So it's not, it's not exactly like rain on, on, on earth that, that we have. We call it helium rain because it's easy to understand, but it's in a way, it's kind of a phase separation, at least in my mind, I, I think about it in this, in these terms. Joe Castro, you know, asks how these new findings affect or constrain the formation and evolution of the solar system. That's a big question too. That's a big question too. Yeah, so I think, again, I, for me, the key is the fact that we find that these composition gradients actually reflect the ratio between the heavy elements and the, and the hydrogen helium gas. So if you take that, you can put some constraint on, on the local conditions of, of Jupiter and the formation time scale. And of course, you can take this information and reflect it on the formation of the solar system as a whole. Yeah, we're coming to the bottom here. So Yuf Hudson asks about seismology, again, a follow up. How well do we know the mode structure and is the convective excitation of modes? Of it? Yeah. So, Again, not, not very well. So there, there are a few studies uh, in this direction. Uh, I think uh, Jerry Schubert, for example, uh, was also looking at that. But our understanding of this process is incomplete. If, if people uh, are interested in that, I, I highly recommend to look at this scientific question because I think it is very important and it has great potential. So we ex exhausted all the, the, the questions in the chat. Um, um, and then we have a raised hand. We have a raised hand. So from G Jim Fuller, let me allow him to talk, and then. Uh... Okay, could you please unmute your microphone, Jim? Yep. Hi, Ravi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I had a question about modeling the internal structure. What do you, especially in terms of the heavy element distribution, what do you think is the biggest theoretical uncertainty? Is it? the double diffusive convection, or is it the rate of core erosion, or how convection mixes heavy elements? What do you think we need to, which, which bit of the physics do we need to improve to improve the model? 
Yeah, uh, I, I would say in all these fonts, right? So I think I think core erosion and its efficiency is something we have to look at, but this is linked to understanding uh, the solubility of, of heavy elements. Um, but at the same time, you need to understand the efficiency of convection. And of course, we use, you know, mixing lengths for standard convection, or you have some kind of uh, parameterization for the for the layered convection, which is also we don't understand very well, especially not in the regime of, of, of Jupiter. Um, personally, what I would recommend is to take different different profiles, you know, like different heavy element uh, compo uh, composition gradients with different associated temperatures and pressures, and just see how things change in terms of you know in terms of uh, you know seismology and things like that, and how extended the region is. It's also for me important to say that we have to keep in mind that we have this magnetic field and we know that there should be a region that is that is kind of um, convective, um, or fully convective, I'm not sure. It could be maybe layered convection, but I think we have this constraint as well and we have to think to, to keep that in mind. Um, but as I guess your question already imply, our knowledge in, in, in this direction is, is kind of um, limited and I think there is a lot to be done. Okay, I have one more in the chat. Um, do diffusive depletion of metal elements occur in Jupiter's core or do they transport to the planet's surface by convection? So we don't know really what is happening in the, in the deep interior and we don't know really what is the composition of the core and we don't know whether it is convective and we don't have some kind of a core envelope uh, boundary and so on. In principle, if Jupiter would be fully convective, which we think it's not the case now, you, one could drag some elements from the deep interior to the to the outer part of the planet. But according to Juno data, this uh, is probably not the case. Okay. Uh, well, I think we've come to the end. Thank you very, very much again, Ravi. This has been really great. Uh, and thank you very much for attending the seminar. Uh, we had 200 um, uh, uh, people, you know, joining us today. Uh, and uh, next week we will have Athena Kusnis uh, speak on Titan and the Cassini-Huygens uh, mission. And then the week thereafter, uh, Jessica Agarwal on, um, on Rosetta. And, um, you know, do you, if you want to recommend this talk, I mean, it's, go it's going to be available, I think, tonight already. Uh, on our web page and you can download it from there or hear it there again and look at you know what what graphs uh, Ravid uh, showed in detail so thank you very much again and uh, you. see you next time bye 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 bye, bye, -bye.